quick say. And do you want to try to? Uh, oh, share the screen. Watch sure. your yeah. stuff on the screen. Yeah, sure. Oh yeah, yeah, we're good. And in, in, in the normal course of things um, as well, you know, I've, you know, I, you, you know, people can go and watch this after the fact. So I've packed, you know, 400 megabytes of material into 40 slides, right? So I mean, oh. I, it's just going to go whipping by. And anyway, that's, yeah, that's and, cool. You know, yeah. So people can, can uh, go back and dig in detail later. And so, so Rick, is, is Nathan still there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Oh, sure. Keep, keep part of this program, actually. Oh. Uh, right, right, directly engaged in it. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please give him my best. I will. Absolutely. Yeah. Pleased to do that. And uh, so, you do. You, you know, we're 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 getting a a, a few people, few more people online coming up towards the hour, so we'll give it a couple more minutes. And and sure. and you. I can see you've got some people here who are, who are going to ask you some tough questions. Perfect. There we go. That's the that's the ticket. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are you, John? I, I'm I, I'm well. How about yourself? Good. Thanks. Getting a snowstorm. Um. Well, for us, it was in the valley. It was pretty wimpy, but. Um, Professor Bazant is online and, and he, he's in the mountains. Maybe they got a lot of good skiing snow. Hmm. <clears throat> well, we had 20 degrees above zero last Friday and here it is minus 10, but what is 20 with the wind chill last couple of days in Calgary? Well, that's, that's kind of normal, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not good, but it is normal. <laughs> How are you doing, Rick? Good, good. Good. Good morning, Sid. I'm talking to an empty chair. <laughs> yeah, we well, did get up and run away here. <laughs> morning, Ali. Okay, so maybe we'll. Oh, <laughs> Maybe we'll maybe we'll kick this off, and there will be a, a few more people that that will come come along. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, it's 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 a real pleasure today to have uh, Professor Rick Chalaternik uh, speak to us. And Rick is a professor of geotechnical engineering in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Alberta, and he holds an NSERC Energy uh, Simulation Industrial Research Chair in Reservoir Geomechanics, and. So prior to joining the university in 1997, Rick had co-founded a reservoir surveillance company. And uh, after joining the university, he was uh, the executive VP of OpenSense, which was a company that sort of foreshadowed a lot of things that are going on now. And that company was involved in providing fiber optic and non-fiber monitoring solutions for SAG-D and to the CO2 storage world. Uh, at the university, he has established the Reservoir Geomechanics um, Research Group, and this has four unique geo-innovation environments, and this includes 3D printing of rocks, high temperature pressure, and reservoir geomechanics testing, and there's also a geotechnical beam centrifuge. Rick's got, uh, Rick has uh, 20, 20 years of C uh, experience in CCUS as well, and he is currently working with PTRC and SAS Power in the Aquastar project. Um, and um, in addition to all of this, Rick has founded GeoVare Inc. Um, and that's a reservoir geomechanics consulting company. And so um, a real pleasure today to welcome uh, Professor Rick Chalaternik. Thanks, thanks very much, John. And, and it definitely is a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation to speak today. And, um, you know, as we were speaking before, um, really a, an opportunity for, for me anyway to think back about some of the experiences we've had in 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 <clears throat> excuse me thinking about this pressure meter work uh and and yeah look forward to sharing that with with the audience today so let me let me just dive right into it and and we'll get started 
Um, let me find a laser pointer here just to make sure I can point at things. Um, so a little bit, I, I just, I'm not going to spend much time on the couple first ones. I think most of the people on the audience kind of really will probably understand pressure meter testing. Um, maybe a little bit about, about our motivation for why we were trying to go this route <laughs> and then give you some experience about how we've transitioned from, you know, roughly 2000, some early experiences all the way through to some recent experience. Um, uh, we're trying to run the tool at 900 meter depths and in, um, uh, Switzerland and then a, a bit of a summary and a road ahead. Cause you definitely not, the answers don't haven't all been <laughs> answered. Um, you know, so I think generally most people understand this pressure meter testing, um, inflatable membranes, um, you know, developed for a lot of work in geotechnical engineering, uh, you know, insert them, uh, into the ground, a bunch of internal stuff depends on which style you want. Um, but really it's the bottom two bullet points at the, at the base self board, um, and pre board. You, you have, you, so these two major techniques in which you can insert this, this device, if you like, into the ground, uh, inflate and deform the borehole wall to ex try and extract information. Um, and that's been the, that, that's sort of been the family of, of, of the tool, um, for, for, um, for a lot of years um and and just because of the the presentation and going through a bit of the history there's a couple two versions uh that people should be i don't know kind of sensitive to there's one that's that that's dependent on fluid volume um you know right to day one menard pressure meters and so on that's injected volume and you create a a plot of cavity pressure versus volumetric um uh, cavity strain and you can extract some data and then the second version is the, the, the one that's typically referred to as a pressure meter, uh, as opposed to a dilatometer uh, kind of technique. And it has internal deformation gauges. So it's on the inside, it can measure um, specific um, directions of radial deformation. And you get a, a slightly more um, uh, exacting uh, response of the, of the borehole. And that's probably primarily what we wanna talk about today. Um, I think in the context of all of this thing, what I wanted to do was to show, uh, you know, out of geotechnical engineering in particular, especially in the shallow subsurface, you know, a whole world of work has been thrown at in situ testing. There's quite a legacy. Um, you know, we came at this understanding that a lot of people have done this work. Um, you know, you can see the litany of, of stuff all the way through to, you know, vein shear tests and pressure meter tests and um, uh, hydraulic fracturing uh, in, in, even in the shallow surface, borehole shear tests, uh, and so on. Um, and even you know, when I went back and looked at this history, looked back at 2014-ish and explain a bit about the history, but, you know, even developments um, in, in Russia on, on, in fact, exactly what, I guess in some ways, looks like, you know, a dual packer system. One of the packers used as a, as a pressure meter or a dilatometer and a hydraulic fracturing interval between the two packers. So, you know, it's, it, it, this doesn't come without a lot of experience and a lot of uh, um, previous experience um, in a lot of applications to, to think about this. Um, now, what about our motivation? You know, our motivation is there's a huge family of, of in, from, the, from the geotechnical world, huge family of, of these things. But if you notice that there were two things that, that caught our interest that we wanted to try and answer, one, one was shear modulus and one was horizontal stress and from a conventional geotechnical application generally we <laughs> if you look at these tables that's trying to summarize this work this is usually referred to as the mean horizontal stress and if you look at i remember i pointed out this issue for for those of you who are so you know getting into this pressure meter game the pre-board and the self-boring versions um, this means that there's a pocket you've drilled the borehole already and you slide the tool in and you run your tests and the self-boring means i'm going to drill my own pocket uh, I'm going to drill uh, with the pressure meter. And you can see the ratings here. A is uh, high applicability. C is low applicability in terms of ratings from normal geotechnical applications. Um, and really quite good for, for the sort of hard rock, soft rock uh, kind of applications. Um, but you notice this little application here where it says for shear modulus and horizontal stress applications, pre-board, as typically for geotechnical, it's actually been classified as... Eh, Eh, not maybe not so great. Um, whereas in self boring, typically has a high applicability because you're you're sliding the membrane and everything right along the borehole that you've just drilled. There's no you know convergence of the borehole, swelling, near near borehole damage and stuff. But it, it's a much more complicated, much more difficult uh, process to do. And so we 
we kind of wanted to sort of look at this and say, okay, um, what, what, what if we challenge this? What if we challenge this, this ability in the pre-board? Um, it's a, and, and the reason to do that was, is that because perhaps it had a much greater application at depth. So that was really, um, if you like, initially was a bit of the naive questions. We, we knew that there was a world of experience and expertise in the geotechnical world, which is pre pretty much where I come from. Um, but we said, well, listen, can we do other stuff? Can we, can we take this and, and utilize, if you like, uh, deeper uh, technologies uh, used in the oil and gas world and, and maybe change the ratings, if you like, even on a pre-board pressure meter? So our experience started, or my experience started, I guess, in involvement in something called the gas over bitumen hearing in Alberta uh, a little while back. Um, and there was some work that had to be done in terms of, of uh, oil sands behavior. And um, uh, Gulf Canada at the time was, was, um, was brave enough to let us give this a go. Um, and so we took a um, Hughes in situ pressure meter, large diameter beast that you see in the picture, uh, converted it to wireline uh, conveyance, it's pre-board. Um, and ran it and, and you know, got it down to 370, 300 and, you know, uh, 75 meters, 250 meters. Uh, did a, a normal kind of pressure meter cycles uh, that you see here, uh, unload reloads, you, you'll see those a lot. Um, and, you know, was able to sort of go in and calculate uh, shear modulus from these unload reload um, uh, tests. Um, and it was, you know, uh, you know, reasonably successful. I'm not sure what the r squared on that little fit would be but you know not, not necessarily all that great but you know a lot of uncertainty at the sh uh, uh, shallower depths but a little bit more repeatability at depth but gave us an indication that you could actually compute these in situ likely larger scale upscaled kind of parameters and, and that got us thinking or got me thinking anyway and so our first evolution towards um, this um, sort of reservoir geomechanics application of the pressure meter uh, came with a, with an application we did for some some infra, infra, instrumentation and infrastructure that that uh, we used to develop these geo innovation environments and so our CFI application in 2008 was ultimately successful and what happened was it gave us the resources to then basically purchase a high pressure pressure meter from Cam in situ which really are the at the moment I. I'm hoping that most people who do this would consider them to be the gods of, of this this thing. They the, the 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 amount of expertise buried in in people like Robert Whittle and you know the owner at the time Clive Dalton and such uh, Simon the young guy here on the left was still with the company. Uh, they 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 were outstanding, um, and so that was that was uh, our start. Um, and so what why were we trying to do this? We were interested in situ stress initially. That was our key um, uh, focus. But the other one was rock mass. So the other issue was a lot of data comes from labs, la, uh, lab tests on core, and the issue was the pressure meter allowed us to upscale. You had a, you know, uh, packer interval that was at least a meter uh, uh, long, sampled a much larger volume of rock. Um, and so what did that mean uh, in terms of the properties? And so that's what we did. Uh, we, we started out. Um, we started out initially playing around looking at MDT testing um, and then really this second bullet point was the point is so could we could we think of a new generation of a pressure meter we could deploy on wireline um, uh, and measure both magnitude and orientation of the horizontal stresses um, uh, and and in, in invert for for things like in situ stress so that's really what the journey is about uh, so let me share a bit of the data so we did some stuff with MDT testing there's some work in in unconsol highly overall consolidated clay shales um, that showed um, you know, some, some interesting interpretations, but essentially what happened was, is the MDT in terms of the packer, especially the sleeve fat, uh, uh, packer stages was the same as in a Menard pressure meter. It's a volume of fluids that's injected into a packer. Uh, you get expansion pressure with volume and you can interpret some data. And in this particular case, it was kind of ill constrained. And so Nadia had to do some fluid structure interaction. She modeled the packer response and the, the volume of fluids to try and back out. And essentially, it, in, you know, we were able to go in and sort of do it in an a, a inversion or a history matching to this that would calculate maximum and minimum horizontal stresses and, and map to this particular data for stages of an MBT testing. And it was, it was good, it, it worked out, and um, it, it gave us a lot of information about how to move forward. 
I think the major um, uh, way forward came with Lang's uh, MSC thesis. Lang, um, we knew we had the, the pressure meter. Uh, we're going to convert it to an RGP. And basically the question to Lang was, um, number one, um, do we stand a chance of inverting for in situ stress? Um, and number two, <coughs> what instrumentation, um, other than the normal geotechnical instrumentation, should we place on the inside of this tool to sort of improve its performance? So Lang did a really great job, uh, outstanding. Ah, there's a there's a flow chart there in, in on the right hand side, and did a lot of work on anisotropy where sheared zones developed, um, yielding relative to the response, and came up with a, <coughs> a technique. I'll show you a little bit here in a, a little bit where we we invert for a whole series of parameters here uh, around uh, horizontal stress, the horizontal stress ratios, shear modulus, and, and such. And I'll, I'll show you that in a little second. Um, I think one of the things that was, I think for me, uh, throughout this process that was really quite uh, substantial um, uh, learnings uh, had to do a lot with uh, compliance. Um, it, we know that in the geotechnical world, uh, but what's really interesting is, is we've transferred this to the reservoir geomechanics world and to much stiffer rocks, that this issue around compliance has really, um, um, I don't know, it's, it's raised its head, even even till today, actually. So. The other thing, um, and, and that's just what this simulation is, is, is just trying to depict, was the, the, the assumption of our solutions for a lot of these things in terms of analytical solutions around cavity strain, um, assume either drained or undrained responses. And what we realized is that in many cases, uh, with the many classes of rocks like this, uh, you, 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 have some, you have some challenges uh, around those, those particular boundary conditions and assumptions. Uh, about how you interpret those uh, during your tests, um, and so some really interesting work on um, on uh, on pore pressure response. Um, one of the first chances we had to try and interpret for in situ stress was uh, some pressure meter tests that were run at the uh, URL in in Belgium uh, in the boom clay. So there were some pre board uh, tests that run in the walls of the of the tunnel. Um, uh, these were these were conducted by uh, Cam in situ. We were kind enough to share the data when we were trying to do this. So they they were at, at depth. You can see the the test drifts here and 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 drilled boreholes into the wall, and then actually ran pressure meter tests and interpreted it, interpreted the data. Um, and so what we were interested in is well, could we utilize our inversion techniques to try and analyze what that in situ stress looked like? It was kind of our first foray into this, if you like. Um, and so, yeah, so you, you, had, you had a bunch of information. So we were, you know, we had to invert for shear modulus, um, um, minimum stresses, uh, stress ratios and stuff. Um, one of the things I should point out, and I, I wanted to point out for everybody who sort of plays with this data or looks at this data, is that in general, in geotechnical engineering, when you see these kinds of tests, you typically get the dotted line that you see here. So you, this is a sort of first indication about um, a conversation around anisotropy is that if you notice this dotted line, uh, on average, you get expansion pressure on the y-axis, cavity strain on the x-axis, and you get an average, and you can use a, a, a wealth of theories uh, that exist to analyze that. But you, what you will notice is that when you're sitting inside of an anisotropic stress field, <clears throat> you get three different kind of responses from offsetting arms. So the blue, the green, and the red are in actual fact the responses full, over the full inflation cycle of each of those sets of arms. So in these particular cases, the arms one and four, so it's like a diametrical measurement, if you like, at, at 60 degrees. So, so really, um, uh, you know, started to sort of look at this and say, yeah, this is really where we want to start extracting data. And so what you do is you, you, you go in and you can use this inversion technique and you can go in, there's, we you know, this is some early, this is some early data on the, on the lab data. You have upper bounds, lower bounds, and you can go in and you can generate a fit to the data and um, uh, um, interpret for those parameters based on the fits of all three diametrical arms. Um, and so, so, oops, okay, it's switching like crazy or I'm touching, touching something. Um, and so, so if you look at this, you can, you can go in and do all of these interpretations. I don't want to do this in, in detail, but you can take in each of these particular tests, nine, nine and a half meter depth, this is in a single borehole in the wall of the tunnel, a two meter depth and a one meter depth. 
and each of these will have uh, separate armed uh, responses. You can see in a certain location here, um, I've, I've actually forgotten which, I think this might have been the shallower depth, you can see that the blue and the green almost overlap and the red arm at, at a particular orientation uh, is, is differentiated, differentiated, whereas in this separate location, all three separate. So you get quite a great indication of the anisotropy. And so you could ask yourself, well, how did we do? Well, you know, I guess, you know, perhaps as a first go, we, we, we did not too bad. Um, you know, a theoretical uh, change in the stresses uh, out from the borehole wall uh, would look something like that, circumferential and radial stresses. And so here was the inverted, uh, inverted for minimum and inverted for maximum. And you say, well, okay, it's, you know, it's a valiant effort off, off the get-go. Um, and, and as well as a part of the inversion is um, inverting for pore pressure. And so, you know, I mean, it was a reasonable start. So what this realized in the journey was uh, we needed a way to be a lot more certain. We needed controlled boundary conditions um, instead of it being unknown in order to check whether this was going to work or not. So we were fortunate enough in our early phase of our study to do some work at a um, uh, large polyaxial facility in Longfeng uh, with a, a sponsors in one of our studies, um, the RIPED folks, CNPC. And so Lang, <clears throat> the, the fellow who did his master's degree, spent some time with the colleagues um, uh, in, in Longfang. And we ran, basically uh, created a, for, for better or worse, a, a flexible concrete um, uh, cement blocks that sort of mimicked, they, they weren't hard concrete, they were, they were meant to mimic sort of weak, uh, weak rocks. And uh, we ran a series of, of tests so we could apply the boundary conditions and, and, and look at the responses. And so, you know, there were a lot of things that came out of value from this test. We, we, we could confirm um, this, this issue about stress ratio. This is test number five, six, and seven. Um, and you had the N, the, the horizontal stress ratios, and you can see the differentiation that occurs between the directions of movements in either the maximum and the minimum direction based on this uh, stress ratio. Um, uh, we applied uh, th three different set of boundary conditions. One of the things that we did find, which caused us a little um, grief afterwards, was that even though we we're applying flat plates at the boundaries here, uh, there were stress distributions that were occurring that changed. It wasn't a, a completely perfect uniform stress boundary in the middle, unfortunately. So that caused us some little, some fun in the interpretation. Um, but what was interesting is, and, and this again is, you, you'll see this over and over and over again, um, is the top curve is, is that kind of that average curve that you typically see. And even in these, per, you know, relatively perfect materials, you can see the differential responses that are occurring uh, from all of the arms. And this becomes valuable information. Um, so you can go in, grab the data, uh, analyze it, conventional techniques, um, invert for, for stresses. So I can, I can use the this sort of, you know, these are people can read the equations and people have probably done this before, cavity expansion theories, and you can analyze the average curve. Usually when you do this, it, it, you remove unload reload cycles and things like that, but you can see that you do that and you get a, a, an interpreted mean stress of, you know, in this particular case, 3.1 3 MPA, which is right between the two boundary stresses that were applied to the model, 2.6 right in between the two and 2.9 right sort of right in between the, the values. Now, for us, the issue was trying to extract more information was, could I actually now back out those boundary stresses? And so now that meant going back in, utilizing this inversion technique. And um, so, you know, how did we do? Well, um, you know, because of this variation, it, it, it got a little dodgy. Uh, maybe some other time we can chat about it, but, um, you know, a reasonable enough evidence that suggested that we were able, by matching all of the responses, the differential response of the arms in the inversion technique, could actually back out um, um, these estimates of maximum and minimum horizontal stress uh, in the, from the testing. So it gave us some confidence um, and uh, to, to, to continue down that path. And down that path meant actually getting into the field. And so this is I share with you some results of, of running some tests um, <clears throat> in the field, north northeastern Alberta, um, uh, down to depths of 450 meters. Uh, in this particular part of the world, uh, cyclic steam stimulation is done. 
And this was a, a series of tests that were done in the Westgate the formation, the Jolly Foo formation, and then and two tests right in the in the Clearwater uh, uh, shales just above the uh, above the above the reservoir. So here's the you know the Smiley crew out on the site and um, running the tests. And so <clears throat> again, if I if I go in and I look at these series of five tests that were done from the Westgate all the way down, this is this is just an image of the Westgate. Um, what I wanted to show was, you know, again, if, if this was conventional geotechnical, we'd give you the black curve, it's the average one, you would analyze it relative to, this is measured displacement, but, you know, you could convert it to cavity strain. But this is, in fact, what all of the arms looked like from, from the Westgate. So, you know, we can go in and utilize all that data, you can go into all of the unload reload cycles, which is a really important component. There are kind of a couple issues that you have to think about here, these whole tests these unload reloads are really important in these particular series of tests and multiple of them. You'll see them a bit more uh, uh, in another test done in the Monterey Labs. Um, and you can, you can go in, you can, you can calculate shear modulus values from these unload uh, reloads as a function of deformation or shear strain. Um, and you can look at and compare it to lab data, um, you know, and they get fairly close uh, to lab data. Stress pass are a little different. Um, but but it was it was uh, it was good. So we did this in multiple locations. Um, um, also took a shot at at saying, well, okay, um, uh, what about what about using this inversion technique to not only back out uh, shear modulus values, but to make a um, um, prediction of in situ stress uh, in this environment. And so again, uh, took the techniques, applied them to all of the arms. There's a bit of few connect uh, corrections that you can make. Uh, to some of these kind of things, you can look at the curves and look at how the anisotropic deformation occurs in the borehole wall. You can utilize that information uh, in, in your analysis. And so in, in 2016, early on, um, this was, we took the technique and applied it consistently to all of the depths. And this was essentially what we got. So if you take all of this, and, and this is kind of what we ended up with, is that we got a profile of minimum stress. Uh, I'm just I'm just referring to the purple one. The green one is 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 an average uh, overall test. That's like the mean mean stress distribution. But if you look at the the purple ones, you get the minimum uh, horizontal stress distribution and an, an interpretation of the maximum horizontal uh, uh, stress distribution. What we realized, uh, you know, uh, with the, really an acknowledgement to CNRL in, in, in helping us work through this, but they asked some really important questions actually. And they asked us, said, well, okay, that's nice. And sure, you, 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 you decide in this inversion technique that you 23.5 kPa per meter is what you've interpreted for minimum stress, plus minus what? Where does the uncertainty lie? And that actually ended up being a very important question, actually a very critical question, actually. So we, we revisited a lot of this. We, we revisited issues around uh, displacement arms, uh, compliance factors, membrane thinning, protective slips, metal, metal slips, uh, pressure measurement. Um, we looked at optimization approaches. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people on the call more expert at this than, than I am. Um, and then really started to worry about uh, what unload reload uh, inversion workflows look like. And one of the things we did do um, was is in the inversion decided that we needed to map um, to the complete response of the material. Like we needed to not just do the overall curve, like as in a cavity strain, we needed to actually match in the inversion technique the whole curve. So this is just gives you an example of what you attempt to do. So you're trying to use different techniques to map on unload and reload, in other words, an elastic and yielding and, and, and so on. So, so how did we do? Well, the, how this eventually uh, in, in 2020, in terms of the interpretation, went from what you saw on the left here is, is more this interpretation on the right. So we got um, these show the error bars of, of um, what happened when we looked at that uncertainty. There was a bit of, as you went deeper, there was a, a bit of uncertainty around the pockets and such. So there's a bit more uncertainty at, at depth, but it, it generated this distribution of minimum stress and this particular distribution of maximum uh, horizontal stress. Uh, and in out of the inversion technique, this distribution of the mean stress, which thankfully fell um, between the minimum and maximum. Um, so that was so that was good. There's ongoing work. Uh, it's continuing, um, and again, I think gave us some confidence that that perhaps there is a way to actually utilize this um, on the in situ stress side. 
Um, but what happened was, is there was a bit of a, a shift a little bit because we were given an opportunity to run these RGP tests in the Monterey labs in Switzerland. Um, and this really became the, the subject of Lang's uh, PhD work and really gave us a lot more insight around anisotropy and shear modulus. So that's kind of what I want to share with, with everyone today is that, um, you know, we were given, given the opportunity to go in um, to a test gallery <clears throat> or a, t a test drift that was um, um, uh, excavated off a brand new gallery that was ex uh, um, um, excavated at, at well, near when we were there, uh, or went by uh, when we were there. And uh, we got to do uh, a series of tests, one in a borehole where we were testing perpendicular to bedding, and in one we were uh, testing parallel to bedding. Um, and in being able to conduct really a, a significant number of tests, unload reload cycles all the way up, uh, trying to get you know as high a pressure as we could uh, in these intervals. And so um, really a, a phenomenal data set that, that Lang has really spent a great deal of time. This is a, a series of tests um, here. This BGC, a, the A4 test is with um, uh, parallel to bedding. This particular set of experiments is perpendicular to bedding. Um, and this is some very early work that was done with a, a sole experts dilatometer uh, in a, another borehole back here in 2017. Uh, that was also useful. This, a lot less unload reload cycles uh, than you would particularly like, but but there was enough in here to be able to use for some interpretation. And so the part that was extracted from this, for those of you folks that you know that are worried about anisotropy and shear modulus and and so on, is that what really came out about um, this particular testing was using very specific techniques to analyze the unload uh, response of these materials, uh, sort of into the elastic range. And, and really trying to look at stress depend, strain dependency of shear modulus values. So you've got shear modulus values as a function of shear strain that can be extracted directly from the, the data. Um, and so this is, this is a, a set of experiments, if you like in perpendicular to bedding, this would be a set of experiments that were parallel to bedding. And you can see some characteristic change in the responses, you know, both the sandy faces, loving. Um, one of the things that was interesting is that um, if you look at the starting pressure of the unload reload cycles, is there was an interesting response here in terms of the interpretation, the shear modulus versus the pressure at which you start the unload uh, response. Um, really, th you had to get above this sort of 5 MPA number. And once you did, you, you tended to find that your shear modulus values um, tended to sort of achieve a, 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 a constant value, more or less. Um, and what was interesting is, is that piece, uh, 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 an expansion pressure of 5 MPA ended up being, you know, very close to the mean stress. So there are lots of learnings from this, actually, lots, lots of learnings. Um, again, you know, a lot of information on this slide, but one of the other, one of the things I do want to point out with this particular side, slide had to do with anisotropy um, and this issue around shear modulus. People who are studying this in, gore, in great detail is that, you know, these kinds of tests especially when these unload reload cycles are, are conducted in an appropriate way, is that when you extract this information, you can actually calculate um, shear modulus values uh, in two different orthogonal orientations um, and generate really some, 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 some extremely valuable information about how, how that shear modulus varies as a function of, of anisotropy in the borehole. Um, it really, really impressive stuff actually. Um, one of the other things that really was nice about this particular test actually was um, that um, a fellow, uh, Christoph Schuster, BGR, had conducted uh, some what he calls an interval velocity measurement technique. It's basically a smaller scale um, uh, interval velocity measurement allows him to conduct P wave velocity measurements azimuthally around the boreholes, these small boreholes. And, and what you're able to do is actually map this sort of degree of for lack of a better term, excavation uh, damage zone anisotropy locally that you can use in the, we used in the interpretation of the pressure reader testing. So that it actually, it was a way to constrain the data extremely well. So this has turned out to be an extremely valuable data set. And, um, you know, this is something that Lang is just in the process of finishing his PhD on and, and, and working towards. So following this uh, whole series of work, um, we were really provided a, another phenomenal opportunity um, uh, by Nagra um, to 
to build a, a specialized tool. We called it RGP2N. Um, a bit of a monster. You can see the picture there. Uh, uh, meant to run down sort of below 900 meters. Um, you know, a lot of capabilities. Um, built in some other ca capabilities and responses. Um, upped a bit of the pressure uh, capability from a normal uh, set, um, tool. Um, and really got a chance to, to, to run this thing. Um, I, I, I do want to acknowledge uh, some incredible support uh, provided by a couple individuals, Nagra, the Nagra organization in particular, but Rodney uh, Gerard and Silvio uh, Geiger at, um, at Nagra because um, you know, we learned a lot from this. We learned a lot uh, from what it takes to deploy these tools, what it takes what to do, what not to do. Um, uh, this is a kind of a um, good experience, bad experience, um, uh, but we learned a lot uh, and, and continuing to work on, on, on how to move forward uh, and learnings from this particular tool and, and running at these particular depths. So, so what about a summary road ahead for us? Um, you know, we kind of ended up sticking numbers on these things. RGP one was the modification of the CAM in situ tool. RGP two, um, you know, I think I will say in a nutshell that I think we have have concluded that uh, for a lot of these interpretations for anisotropy and and especially particularly in situ stress, we think um, uh, self boring is 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 really going to be the only way to go. Um, RGP2N deployment challenges, we learned a lot, um, actually a great deal. And, you know, ultimately in the end where we're at now is, is really deploying tools and wireline with self-boring capability and really a lot more advanced uh, surveillance. Um, and, I, and I thought I would throw this in, this is really early work um, of us uh, designing the tool towards self-boring, um, uh, drilling, um, you know, being able to control uh, holes under under mud flow conditions, um, uh, so this is just a, a localized test that we ran, uh, where this is now drilling the, the pressure meter tool is drilling into the ground, um, circulating mud up. So it gives you hole control um, and other things, but 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 uh, I I think this is a, um, this is going to be the kinds of things that's going to be required for us to really get. Um, uh, exacting data, uh, reduce our uncertainties for in situ stress interpretation. Um, yeah, I think you, 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 I'll just let the, the thing run here for a second because it, it's nice to see. So this is the, the part that's interesting here is you have to remember is that these particular, the, the mud, the fluids and the cuttings are coming up the inside of the tool. So, so there are some challenges with this, but these are coming up the inside of the tool and out and then would be circulated to surface. Um, you know, all being driven by uh, by a mud motor. So it's exciting. It's, it's, it's a long. This is a ways. This is a while back, but uh, kind of exciting to see that you know maybe something like this will be possible. Um, for those of you who work uh, in the pressure meter world, here's some pretty classic references. Um, you know, a couple Palmer's 1972. Uh, there's some others uh, as well. Carter and Randolph. Um, uh, you know, Jeffrey's Jeffrey's work in 1988. Anyway, some some great great references. Uh, that, that people can look to. So maybe just in conclusion, give us time for if there's some questions and, and discussion, uh, some acknowledgments to the team, really a, a, a great team of the, of this, the people within the group, um, you know, Hal all the way through to, to, uh, to Hope Walls at the end. It was, it's been an amazing team to work with, uh, exciting uh, support provided by our sponsors of our, our consortium work. Um, and in particular um, uh, of late, uh, CNRL for the field experiments uh, Swiss Topo and Nagra for for some really from for some really amazing support. I think uh, well above and beyond actually. So, so with that, John, I'll uh, I'll conclude. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to share a bit of that history with everybody, and uh, you know, happy to happy to answer any questions if there are any. Uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, just fantastic, fantastic, fantastic work. Um, and, and the self boring really gets you to thinking. Uh, that's that's no easy task. So we do have a few questions online. And the first is from Maricela Sanchez Nagel. And, and, and Maricela appreciates the work, but she would like you to comment on how you consider the effect of the wellbore's shape. Um, yeah, well, uh, ultimately, in the end, that's, this is the move towards uh, self-boring, Maricela. Um, so when you're running a pre-board, um, yeah, you've got to be very careful about the borehole shape. 
Um, there are in the inversion technique. Uh, really didn't show it. Actually, was a little bit in that in that animation. Actually, if I if I can do this fast enough, I'll see what. Oh yeah, good. Okay, well that didn't work. Um, see if I can do this fast without get every, everybody getting motion sickness. Um, uh, this one, Marcella. So if you go here, if I do this, the, the, so this technique. So this one, this particular uh, process for a pre-board, you've got to be very careful with the tool, how it's, how it, its eccentricity in the borel, how the uh, membranes are expanding, when they touch, um, and everything else. And there's a, a, a procedure we've used uh, with onboard instrumentation and other things in there to actually make sure we're correcting for some of that. But yeah, um, you know, that first early uh, in situ stress interpretation, for instance, uh, back here, um, if I can even find it fast enough. Um, no, I'm not going to find it fast enough. Um, was um, those uncertainty bands had to do with borehole shape. That was just not the greatest pocket in the world. Uh, drilling that pocket is a bit of a monster. Yep. So in here, sorry. Yeah, this is what, you know, so some of these... These are unconsolidated, uh, unconsolidated, uh, overconsolidated clay shales. So, in fact, part of this uncertainty band are exactly the question you just asked. Yeah. Thank you, Rick. You're welcome. And and, and Rick, the next the next question is from Sawe Wong, and uh, he says, "Hi, Rick. Thanks for the yeah. presentation. It's right. good to see the long fong experiments gave some good results." Yeah. And, and, and Sawe's question is, how uh, can you talk about how this technology would work in a deviated well bore? Well, it's a no longer it's it, you're no longer in plane, right? So now now you're not uh, um, uh, you know you're making this assumption in these in these vertical boreholes that in plane you've got a you've got a couple principal stresses in in a deviated borehole it's not so much now I, it's not going to make a difference in terms of your interpretation of shear modulus. So all of those things you saw in terms of shear modulus, but your interpretation of the in situ stress field um, requires you to have additional instrumentation. There's gonna have to have something else in the tool. And so that was really that road ahead for us is um, if, if you start putting these into deviated boreholes, what else do you have to put into this tool in order to help you to constrain those numbers? You, you, you're 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 going to get a you're going to get a stress profile but you're you're not going to know you're not going to know which 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 one and where so you you've got to do some extra stuff but but there's no there's no there's there's no reason you can't run it in a deviated borehole or horizontal but so the next question is from Panos and and uh he, he again he appreciated the talk and he was wondering if you taken this one step further and looked at strength parameters oh yeah sure of course yeah yeah absolutely i i don't uh i didn't have time to include it in here but in this in this last bit of work oh and i should have i dong ming i should have included in here he was in the list of the things but in dong ming's work um in that uncertainty characterization when you're when you're actually fitting to the full curve when you fit to this so when you fit to this particular curve you can extract strength but 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 you know being a professor <laughs> uh yeah okay so i say that out loud but you noticed i'm smiling um so you, so you can interpret strength you can uh but um it 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 has lots of assumptions in it um you know you it's it's like anything like this so there's there's a fair amount of work in the optimization but um, you know it, it, it comes with un some uncertainties because you need to make assumptions for it, absolutely. And 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 so so Romain is 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 querying a little bit on on the three dimensionality of the anisotropy, and he says it's a nice, very nice talk. Um, and he says in vertical wells, in vertically transverse isotropic rocks, the tool is probing mainly the horizontal shear. In the cross-sectional plane, yes. yes. Uh, what is the effect uh, and sensitivity to vertical shear in the axial radial plane? Well, that's the, so. What you're depending on. Well, if, if I can find, uh, maybe if I just find a picture. So, so you know what you are depending on is is that, and and it, there have been lots of studies about it. You don't need to be us for for that. But what you're what you're what you're really um, um, trusting 
is that you have this plane, this mid-plane uh, deformation response um, is far enough away from these end boundaries that the, the shear that develops up at the zone does not impact your interpretation at mid-plane. So, so you, you're absolutely right. If you look at this, and you can find lots online, and, and uh, I saw somewhere, somewhere online, I saw Jean de Rocher join, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm going to apologize, and I don't want to date him, but, uh, you know, he, he would have done some of these simulations in it's sort of 19... Well, I better pick a I better pick a more current date. Let's say 1982. I think it's earlier than that, but that's okay. Um, and and so it it's once you're at this in plane part, you're far enough away from this that you're you're hopefully under those those uh, plane stress boundary conditions that that y you are just probing only the the, the horizontal direction. And and maybe this question is from Sean. It's it's from either Sean or Gene, and it says nice talk and great data sets. What limitations do you see regarding the clearance between the packer and the wellbore? Oh. In other words, how mm. much would be the maximum difference in diameter between the tool packer and the bore? Not, not very much. <laughs> it's not very much. You have to be. You have to actually be very, very careful with it. Um, uh, you know, your, you know, that you minimize if for a preboard uh, uh, installation. You know, the smallest you can get away with, but that, that causes some, some challenges in the, in the downhole environment in terms of drilling and boral closure, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, you're, you, you, you really, you, you really don't have a lot of room because what will happen is, is that in, in a lot of these kind of applications for us, especially in the deep borehole, you're not, you're not doing it in the way we would do it normally in geotechnical, where we would have these protective Chinese lanterns, these, these metal, uh, sleeves uh, um, uh, at, that are protecting the tool and things like that. And so what happens is um, you're, you're, um, you're going to actually create a, a case where you actually, you, you can actually create hernias, the hernias with the, the packer around the, the top ends of these, these devices as the deformation occurs, especially trying to deform out to the, to the yield point. Um, and what will happen is, is if you can create the hernia, then you actually create a, a, a very significant risk of membrane rupture. So the, the minimal clearance is the best, and that's why, again, a lot of this experience, some of it bad, we've, I mean, it's some of the support we've had is because we've really been given an opportunity to fail and, and continue, which is, which is not a common thing uh, to have happen. Um, and it, you know, some of the learnings from that really are pushing us towards the ability to, to, to do this with self boring. Thank you no, so much. Uh, thank no you so clearance. Much. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And John, this is John El Curry, not John DeRoche. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Oh, we, <laughs> refer, we refer to ourselves as John E and John D. So, uh, okay. so I'm John okay. E. <laughs> well, thank uh, you so much. Actually, Jean, Jean D does have a question. Uh -oh. <laughs> And uh, he appreciated the talk and he, he liked the Northern Ca Canadian data set quite a bit. And how sensitive do you think uh, it is, your stress inversion is to the, to the rock, your choice of rock behavior? Yeah, that, that again is now exactly, exactly this. We think that in the class of materials uh, that we have in, in sort of north, Northeastern Alberta, uh, you know, over consolidated clay shales, you know, down to that sort of four or five hundred meter depth and stuff. I think, I think, I think we're okay. You know, there's still a move to to generate more information, have some other sensors measuring some other things. It's when you get to the the things that you guys have just been asking about, or those deeper applications, unconventionals. You know, we had been asked early on. Um, I think we did the the testing in northeastern Al uh, Alberta, and of course, uh, you're the fellow you guys all know very well in the community, Alexei. Of course, looked at us and said, "Yeah, okay, well, that's good. Good for you. That, that, don't worry about it. I, can you do it at three thousand meters? All right. So I mean, that was his automatic question. Well, the issue is then is that if you start thinking about pressure meter technology at three thousand meters, you you typically do not get that full displacement curve that is the classic displacement curve that everybody thinks about. There's there's kind of these region A, B, and C, ish kind of regions." Um, and a lot of times in these very, very stiff materials, you can't get out of region B because what will happen is as soon as you get out of region B, you're basically conducting a sleeve frac test. You basically will create an axial, 
uh, fracture in the borehole wall, and then okay, well, you've, you've got a, you've got some other stuff you've got to worry about. So now the question is, is that how, how, how do you start interpreting if all I'm going to get into is in this B region, and that's really what Lang has been spending. That's why the Opalinus clay stuff, okay, not three thousand meters, and and you know, uh, uh, but but it was you know extremely stiff. Uh, materials started to play with what can we extract in that B region. So there's lots to think about of hold tests, unload reloads, multiple unload reloads, uh, those kinds of things. So those are those are parts of the strategy trying to extract information from those materials. Thank you, Rick. Um, I'm I'm I might have missed somebody. If if I did, please unmute yourself and just ask ask your question. Yeah, sorry, this is Jean E again. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, Rick, if you could share uh, something additional or more insight on the Nagra uh, experience in the deep wells. You went briefly over it, but I wonder oh, to what yeah. extent you can share uh, well, results or experience yeah. on that. Yeah, well, I think I, I think in far as part of the tool design and the running, um, you know, uh, Jean D, uh, you know, is, is, is helping Nagar with that. Some great advice back from them. So it was, you know, we're we were given an opportunity to try and push this technology forward. And, and I think the tool design we, we were in, I think the first time we ran it, the membrane burst. Um, uh, so we were able to re, uh, rework it. Um, uh, one of the most valuable lessons uh, really had nothing to do, if you like, with uh, the pressure meter tool itself. It had to do with um, the robustness and the, reliant, the, the resilience, if you like, of deployment. This was really, really where we learned. Uh, I mean, we learned some lessons about this that we will never, we will never deploy the tool the same way ever again. Ever. Um, uh, and... And so, you know, I, I think those were, were there, those were some valuable lessons, and that's why I mean, in terms of the incredible support, I mean, it was a, it was a painful lesson, um, extremely painful lesson, unfortunately, um, uh, in terms of deployment, um, uh, how to package these materials, um, basically survive through the rigors of 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 the drilling rig, um, under all of those risk uh, issues, under hole control. Uh, and so on, speed, uh, robustness. So it's really having to do more with that kind of stuff. I mean, lots of gory details and, and you know, can share share more at some time, but it really had more to do with that rather than um, any sort of particular response to do with how the, the tool is operated. Um, um, so. well, thank you so much, really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. And Jean-Marc uh, does have a question. Have you managed uh, to pressurize fractured fractured intervals to get information on, on uh, the, the minimum principle. So spread. Lang, so Lang, I, I don't, you know, I may not have included the, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to look at the images here from the thing and he gave me, he gave me a plot now, see, and I didn't include it. So now he's going to be, he's going to be angry. Yeah. So it turns <laughs> out that in exactly one of the locations in the Monterey, the pressure meter actually passed by a fracture interval. And so its characteristic response changes completely. You, 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 can, you, you can tell, you can see it. Um, and and um, so, so he's, he's done, now I don't know, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of the interpretation in that location was not really done at the moment for in situ stress. It was done for that anisotropy and shear modulus values between that sort of parallel and perpendicular to bedding structure, right? That whole anisotropy question. Um, so, but the data exists. Yes, the, the data is there, yeah. Uh, John and, and Rick, I have a, a question. Sure, Sid. Uh, uh, if the, and I haven't thought this through, maybe it's our problem, but if the principal stress directions don't coincide with the material property principal directions, is that an issue? I haven't thought it through, but but often that may be the case where the principal stresses directions don't coincide with material stiffness principal directions. Yep. yep. No, it's an issue. Absolutely. Um, and and I think that when it gets you know when you get starting to ask yourself very hard questions about this interpretation, that's exactly the kind of stuff that comes up. You bet. And I think 
that's our motivation, um, Sid, in a way, is, is asking ourselves now, even now, what additional surveillance information do I need in this tool? So if I have this thing's package and I'm running, what, what else should I measure that is going to help me constrain those numbers? Yeah, you certainly could do tests on that big polyaxial machine that you showed a picture of in Long Fong or others would, would allow you to do tests on that, but I can see what would really get complicated in a hurry. Yeah. Anyway, so, I'd like to add two very nice presentations. Rick. They're yeah, very thanks. nice. Yeah, so, but I mean, again, we love 3D printing. Um, you know, we've been printing 3D, we've been printing rocks uh, now yeah. for, you know, eight years. Um, you know, one of the things that we um, have in our mind, I'm not really sure how to configure it quite yet, but is to actually miniaturize the response, which people have done in the lab before, People have built little sort of mini pressure meters for, for lack of a better term. But what we have the capability now in our 3D printer is that we can print um, any range of rocks, but we can print uh, heterogeneity. So we can print uh, multiple materials, different directions, different bedding directions, different uh, geometries and so on. And would be is to go and now sort of play with some of those parameters on something that's a little bit more controllable um, uh, in a little bit more controllable dimensions and see if we can learn any from anything from that. Very nice. Yeah. A any further questions? Uh, Amy Fox, let's see. Great talk, Rick. Um, uh, and Amy wants to know if you've compared any of your oil sands results with uh, nearby DFIT data. Well, yeah, so, so that data that you saw there, uh, Amy, is actually from the Primrose location. So it's exactly in the same location where the flow to surface event occurred. So there are multiple interpretations of MDT and DFIT uh, tests in that area, um, and they don't necessarily align with the interpretations from the RGP tool. But that's the same level we could arm wrestle. We could arm wrestle around the numbers of the RGP, but in the same way that you could arm wrestle around the numbers from the DFITs. So, so it has been. It's there. That's that location. I just didn't. I, I just didn't show all of that data. In fact, I might have. I might have whited out the DFIT data. I apologize, Amy. <clears throat> I just wanted to show the RGP data. <laughs> Uh, Rick, just I don't know if you're aware, but uh, Imperial Oil has run a series of tests in Gold Lake, which doesn't seem to be very far from that, and it's been published, so it can be compared with what yes, you have. Yes, yeah, exactly. There you go. That and that's and that's been ongoing for a while, and Jean, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yep, yeah, perfect. Yep. And and I I forgot what the numbers were, but uh, it, it looks really similar to what you're showing. Yeah, I think, you know, in our particular case, I think what we've been trying to do with the one that I showed uh, and the part for us, I guess, and, you know, you guys, you know, whether you you you, you want to believe us or not is a, a kind of a whole separate story, I guess. But the issue was that the inversion technique absolutely uniformly applied to all of this data without a change. We didn't we didn't do anything different. We mm. took the inversion technique took the data we got in the Westgate, the data we got in the Jolly Flu, and the data from both intervals in the Clearwater, and applied just just applied the technique uniformly to that data set. So it's not like we cherry picked. So we didn't change anything different. We didn't, and so I, I think we're you know we're we're getting more comfortable that that in fact this is 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 getting I don't know is it, it's a chance to provide some value it, a, a, an additional set of information that can provide value you know so beyond in situ stress you can get property measurement you can get shear modulus you can get you know you can get some other some other characteristics that you might need for modeling i agree i love it mm -hmm. well if if there are no more questions then then rick i want to thank you very much i mean really in a, um, a very very uh, I, I guess I'll use the word inspiring. I mean, uh, it, uh, really creative technology. 
and uh, I, I think everyone in the audience tremendously appreciates it. Well, so thanks. thanks. No, thank, thanks, John. Lots of people, I just wanted to share experience. I mean, lots of people playing in this space now, a lot of people chasing in situ stress. You know, you've had some exciting presentations in your forum series and, and things like that. So it was a, a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to share. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Take care. Have a good rest of the week. Thank you so much. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, Rick, that was great. Sorry, John, I uh, I disappeared. <laughs> I, I didn't have a chance to really thank you. I mean, this was fantastic, man. Oh, um, oh you're really, in, really interesting. Well, a bit of our, uh, you know, uh, it's our journey down this path. So we'll see what happens. A lot left to do, but uh, we're kind of, um, you know, for a guy who's, you, you, you know, this is not your first rodeo either. I mean, a part that we're kind of excited about is is this. Um, the 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 self boring version we really think we've got an interesting ability to be able to sort of you know use mud motor technology and a wireline and 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 just run it just run it on on wireline and self bore and and be done with it i mean just mm -hmm. and, and get some incredible data so we'll see i don't you know see what yeah. happens yeah no it's fantastic and uh... It should let you it let you go. Good luck with your uh, hydraulic fracturing today. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, thank you, and yeah. and uh, once again, thanks for doing this. It was it was awesome. I no, appreciate. It. Thanks for the invitation. Okay. okay. See ya. Okay. Take care.